Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Hewitt. Um, as Hewitt shared, over the past year, the St. Luke's Foundation has partnered with the City Club of Cleveland and the Cuyahoga County Place Matters team to raise this issue of why place matters. And although today is the fourth and final uh, in the series, we, we really hope that it is the beginning of a dialogue, a much larger dialogue, about what we do in our community to end inequity. We've learned so much, so much from this series. And what we've learned that in our own community, concentrated poverty has restricted opportunity in many, many ways. By channeling poor, mostly residents of color, into neighborhoods with lower performing schools, fewer empl employment opportunities, smaller returns on real estate, fewer parks and green spaces, fewer safe places to walk and play. And we've learned the startling impact of those things on life expectancy. Today, we are blessed with yet another teacher of more valuable lessons. Dr. Kamara Jones' work includes being the research director of health and equity in the Division of Adult and Community Health at the Centers for Disease Control, and she is also an adjunct professor at the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University and an adjunct associate professor at Morehouse School of Medicine. Dr. Jones' academic credentials include degrees from Wellesley College, Stanford University School of Medicine, and the Johns Hopkins School of Hygiene and Public Health. Dr. Jones is a family physician, a methodologist, a teacher, and a social epidemiologist whose work focuses on the impacts of race on the health and well-being of our nation. But as we learned yesterday when she spoke to our board, above all else, Dr. Jones is a masterful storyteller. And today, Dr. Jones is our storyteller. Her stories are particularly relevant to us at this time as we work together to try to improve and transform the health and well-being of our community. Before this series, we could have claimed that we didn't know. But today and after today, we will know. And the challenge and opportunity provided by this knowledge is ours to embrace as a community. Dr. Jones' presentation is entitled, Why Place Matters? toward a national conversation on racism. And it is now my sincere pleasure to welcome Dr. Kamara Jones to the City Club of Cleveland. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Jim Hewitt. Thanks to all of you all for coming here, uh, because this is such an honor actually to be on this platform here at the City Club of Cleveland. And it's an honor to be the fourth and final speaker in the Why Place Matters series. Um, I follow <laughs> Gail Christopher, Ron Sims, Angela Glover Blackwell. And so you all who have been following this series have a good understanding of why place does matter. It, you know that where we live, learn, work, and play profoundly impacts our life experiences and opportunities, resources and risk, exposures, outcomes. But what I want to do today to expand our understanding that we have so far is to point out that the fact that we have a large variety of places is not a given. The fact that there are neighborhoods like the Lyndhurst neighborhood here outside of Cleveland where the life expectancy is 84.5 years and eight and a half miles away, there's the Huff neighborhood where the life expectancy is 64 years. That doesn't just so happen. And the fact that one of the neighborhoods is predominantly white and the other one is predominantly black also is not just a happenstance. So I want to extend the conversation that we've been having about why place matters in two ways. I want to make a distinction between what we've been discussing as the social determinants of health, which include poverty and place, and the social determinants of equity, which include economic systems and racism and sexism. Today, I want to share with you two stories and a treaty. 
I'm going to share with you a cliff analogy, which is going to help us understand three levels of health intervention, including health services, addressing the social determinants of health, and addressing the social determinants of equity. And then I'm going to clear, share with you a Gardner's Tale allegory for understanding three levels of racism, institutionalized, personally mediated, and internalized. And then I'm going to share with you a UN anti-racism treaty. I hope by the end of all of this, I can actually inform you, provide you with tools and frameworks so that we'll all be energized and engaged to become, frankly, anti-racism activists. So I'm going to start out with my cliff analogy. Sometimes I do it with slides, and it's actually like a little animated cartoon. But here I'm going to do it with my voice and my hands. So imagine that somebody's just walking along, doom da doom da doom da doom da doom whoops, boom. Somebody has just fallen off of the cliff of good health. If that were you or somebody in your family, you would be delighted to find an ambulance there at the bottom of the cliff to speed you on to care. But if we're concerned about others who may come along that cliff, if we're consider concerned about community health, population health, public health, we might well ask ourselves, what can we do about this cliff situation besides just stationing lots of ambulances there at the bottom of the cliff? So somebody in this room is going to say, I know, I know, let's put a net halfway down because people will fall, but at least we'll catch them before they get crunched up at the bottom. But we all recognize that nets have holes in them, so some people might fall through the cracks. So somebody else is going to say, well, let's make it a trampoline, no holes, right? But even if you have a trampoline halfway down that cliff face, you might find yourself with lots of people just bouncing up and down at half functionality, not able to get back to the top of the cliff. <laughs> So somebody else is going to say, well, I got the answer to that. Let's put a fence at the edge of the cliff to keep people from falling in the first place. And that's a great idea, but you know what? If there's a lot of population pressure against that fence, then that's not going to be, work so well. So what else can we do as a health intervention? We can move the population away from the edge of the cliff. Place matters, right? So I'm going to label the interventions that I have described so far where the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff clearly represents our medical care and tertiary prevention, where in public health parlance we talk about three levels of prevention, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Primary prevention is keeping things from happening in the first place. Secondary prevention is early detection, screening. And tertiary prevention is, well, you got the disease, but we're going to prevent the complications, like preventing amputations from diabetes. So our ambulance, that represents our medical care and tertiary prevention. The net or trampoline halfway down, that represents our safety net programs and secondary prevention screening, for example, in, uh, pre prenatal care. The fence at the top of the cliff represents primary prevention, keeping things from happening in the first place, immunizations and that type of thing. And moving the population away from the edge of the cliff is all about <laughs> addressing the social determinants of health, like neighborhood conditions, like poverty, educational opportunities, all of that. Now, that little cliff, we could take that a lot of places, right? We could go into a community and say, how should we be spending our health resources? You know, how much on the ambulance versus net versus fence versus moving the population? And any community is going to vote to have a little bit of all of it because, you know, even with HIV, you know, you, you want to do all the prevention, but for the people who are already infected, you need to have the ambulance there. But as useful as this diagram might be, so far there is a fatal flaw in this clip that I've presented, which is it doesn't yet talk about how health disparities arise. So I want you to keep the clip in the back of your mind. We'll shift gears for just a moment to talk about health, how health disparities arise, and then we'll come back to the clip. So how do health disparities arise? Well, especially when you're talking about racial ethnic health disparities, we unfortunately have lots of evidence about differences in the quality of care that some people receive within the healthcare system. Actually, in 2002, the Institute of Medicine released its unequal treatment report, which pulled together hundreds of studies documenting differences in the vigorousness of cardiac care, or even the amount of pain medication you would get if you broke one of your long bones and ended up in an emergency room. But even that panel that published that Institute of Medicine report, they knew that it wasn't all about what's happening within the healthcare system, because there was a problem with access to the healthcare system in the first place. But then even people who realize that say, that's not the whole story, because of course, there are differences in the conditions of our lives. 
there are differences in our exposures and opportunities, resources and risks that are making some individuals and communities sicker than others in the first place. And when you think about these three levels at which health disparities arise, when you think about differences in quality of care, differences in access to care, and differences in underlying exposures and opportunities, truly it's really like a big pyramid and the base of it is the differences in the conditions of our lives. Then you have sicker people who are often frustrated because of limited access to the healthcare system. And then even those who get into the system are sometimes further injured because of differences in the quality of care. So, remem remembering those three levels now at which health disparities arise, differences in quality of care, differences in access to care and differences in underlying exposures and opportunities, let's go back to the cliff. But now when we go back to the cliff, what we're going to recognize is, you know, we're really not dealing with some little two-dimensional flat cliff. Actually, we are dealing with a three-dimensional cliff. And at some parts of the cliff, yeah, there might be an ambulance there, but at those parts, maybe that ambulance has a flat tire. So it's slow or goes off in the wrong direction. Or maybe there's no ambulance there at all. And maybe there's no net, maybe there's no fence, and usually at those parts of the cliff, the, po the population is being pushed closer to the edge. So now, I'm going to label our observations about the three-dimensional cliff with how health disparities arise, where the ambulance that has a flat tire and a slower goes off in the wrong direction, that's about the differences in quality of care. Differences in access to care are represented by no ambulance, no net, no fence. And differences in underlying exposures and opportunities is about the closer proximity of the population in those parts of the cliff to the edge. You will remember that I described moving the population away from the edge of the cliff as addressing the social determinants of health, like poverty, neighborhood conditions, place associated things. But now that we recognize that we're dealing with a three-dimensional cliff, we have a new set of questions that we need to answer and a new set of challenges that we need to address. The first question is, how did the cliff become three-dimensional? And usually that's because of historical injustices that are perpetuated with present-day contemporary structural factors. But then given a three-dimensional cliff, we need to ask ourselves, why are there differences in how resources are distributed along this cliff base? And why are there differences in who's found at different parts of the cliff? Because the green people tend to be clustered here away from the edge, and the purple people tend to be clustered over there near the edge. And when you start engaging in these kinds of questions and trying to address these things, you are now talking about addressing the social determinants of equity, which include systems of distributing resources and populations, big systems of power like economic systems and racism and sexism and the like. And I'm going to talk to you more in detail about those. But you will see that the, the way that you intervene to address the social determinants of health, to move the population away from the edge of the cliff, is a little different from the way that you have to intervene on the systems that are making the cliff three-dimensional and differentially distributing resources and populations. There you have to talk about decision making and that kind of thing. So in this cliff analogy, I have basically distilled three dimensions of health intervention. The first, health services, we can display along a one-dimensional line, the ambulance, net, and fence. These are health services, and when we talk about health in this country, people usually go right there to health services or health care. They will complete your thought for you if you say health. And actually, a lot of our debate in terms of health care reform has been about to really try to get universal access to a high-quality health care system. I think that w that's the, the final goal for many people in this country. But we recognize that that in and of itself will not completely improve in a long and sustained way health outcomes or eliminate health disparities, but it is a prerequisite for living in a civilized society, for valuing all of our people equally. But if we want to have large and sustained improvements in health outcomes, we have to move into the second dimension, which I can display in a plane. We have to move the population away from the edge of the cliff. And if we want to eliminate health disparities and achieve social justice, we have to acknowledge and address the three-dimensional cliff and address the social determinants of equity, which include racism and the like. So now, because my time is quite limited, I'm going to shift and I'm going to give you my second story, which is actually a, a story about racism. But before I talk about racism, I need to give you some definitions. Because when I say racism, first of all, a lot of people get nervous, right, just when I say the word. But, 
Beyond that, we might have different ideas of what we're talking about. So my definition of racism starts out with the fact that racism is a system. So I'm quite clear that I'm not talking about an individual character flaw or a personal moral failing or even a psychiatric illness, as some people have suggested. But I'm talking about a system of power. And a system of doing what? It's a system of structuring opportunity and of assigning value. And on what basis is that opportunity structured and on what basis is that value assigned? It's based on the social interpretation of how we look, which is what we call race in this country. So you're looking at me here standing um, on the stage at the City Club of Cleveland, and I am clearly black. But if you were to look at me in some parts of Brazil, I would be just as clearly white. And if you were to look at me in South Africa, I would be clearly colored. And even though I'd have the same appearance in all three settings, the social interpretation of my appearance would put me into three different racial groups. And even if I, would, if I were to stay in any of those settings long enough, then my health outcome would probably take on that of the group to which I've been assigned, even though I would have the same genes in all three places. So I have defined racism as a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on the social interpretation of how we look, based on race. And the impacts of this system are one, that it unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities. And when we think or talk about racism at all in this country, that's usually how we think about it. But at the same time, we have to recognize that every unfair disadvantage has its reciprocal unfair advantage, so that racism is also unfairly advantaging other individuals and communities. And that's the whole issue of unearned white privilege, which we hardly ever talk about in this country. But then even as we recognize that we have a system that's either unfairly disadvantaging or unfairly advantaging individuals and communities, the big aha is that this system is sapping the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. And what do I mean by that? Well, a clear example is how we as a country still are not yet investing in the full, excellent public education of all of our kids. It's almost as if the blinders of racism that don't value all of us equally have made us believe that there's no genius in the barrios or in the ghettos or on the reservations, that we can get along very well, thank you, without those kids. But of course there's genius in all of our communities. And if we were to invest in the full, excellent public education of all of our kids, we could be doing so much better as a nation or even as a world. The blinders of racism that are sapping the strength of all of us are also manifest in how we as a nation are complacent with the wholesale warehousing disproportionately of so many of our black and brown men in our prison system, as if that did not separate us from human potential. If you have ever gone and talked to people who have been in or out of the prison system, you know there are many geniuses up there that if there had only been some other way, could have made a profoundly positive impact on our society. And I recommend to you all a book by Michelle Alexander called The New Jim Crow, Eye-Opening. So, I'm going to move from that definition of racism to talk about racism. I guess before I move, I want to say this. I said racism could unfairly disadvantage some, unfairly advantage others, and saps the strength of the whole society. Perhaps the most important point there, and perhaps the point that we in, in research, we in media, we as storytellers need to bring up is how it's sapping the strength of all of us, because that's going to be the point that's going to motivate all of us to action. Now, to understand how racism could impact health or education or income or any of the things that it can impact, I find it useful to think about racism on three levels. Institutionalized, personally mediated, and internalized. I'm going to very quickly define each of these because I think understanding them is, is really made more whole by the story that I'm going to share. My definition of institutionalized racism is that system that results in differential access to the goods, services, and opportunities of society by race. This is the kind of racism that doesn't require an identifiable perpetrator. It often shows up as inherited disadvantage and it is institutionalized in our laws and in our customs and in our practices and policies so that it shows up in terms of uh, differential access to quality housing or equal educational opportunities or equal employment opportunities or even the same level of income at the same level of employment. Differential access to medical facilities, including linguistic access. Differential access to a clean environment and the differential placement of toxic dump sites in certain communities. Differential access to power, knowing somebody on the board, or power as voice in media or voice in the government. I want to quickly say that even though I say, sometimes people stop me and they say, wait, you just said housing. 
employment, education, income. Isn't that what we call social class in this country? Why are you saying you're talking about racism when you just gave this whole list and it's all about social class? Are you talking about racism or are you talking about social class? And that's such an important question that I want to deviate for a minute to answer that. And my answer starts with the fact that it doesn't just so happen that people of color in this country are overrepresented in poverty while white people in this country are overrepresented in wealth. That is not just a happenstance. And for each stigmatized, marginalized, oppressed group, there's been some initial historical insult or injustice. So for American Indians, it was the taking of the land and then the genocide and the moving of the survivors to reservations. For people of African descent, it was the kidnapping of West African people and our importation across the Atlantic with tremendous loss of life in the Middle Passage. And then for the survivors, what I describe as the coerced usury of our unpaid labor for centuries to build this country. But then people will stop me there and they say, well, Dr. Jones, you're talking about slavery. But don't you realize that the enslaved people were emancipated in 1865? And that's fully 137 years ago. So all else being equal, don't you think the impacts of slavery would have washed out by now? But the key phrase there is all else being equal. And all else has not been equal since 1865, and all else still is not equal today. And there are what I describe as contemporary structural factors that are perpetuating those initial historical injustices. So when you ask me, am I talking about social class or am I talking about racism, I answer that institutionalized racism explains why we even see an association between social class and race in this country. It's a very important insight, and during the question and answer period, we can talk about that more. Um, before I leave institutionalized racism, though, I just need to say that it can be through acts of doing, acts of commission, as well as acts of not doing, acts of omission, and very often, institutionalized racism shows up as inaction in the face of need. Personally mediated racism, I define as differential assumptions about the abilities, motives, and intents of others by race, and then differential actions based on those assumptions. So that's what most people think of when they hear the word racism. Somebody did something to somebody. It includes the prejudice, the different idea, and the discrimination, the different action. How could that impact your health or anything? Well, police brutality, perhaps being pulled over for driving while black and then interpreted as resisting arrest and hit upside the head or worse. Physician disrespect can be as subtle as a physician not giving a patient the full range of treatment options because the physician assumes that that patient couldn't afford or wouldn't comply or wouldn't understand. Or it could be quite blatant as in the many different iterations of sterilization abuse that we've had in our nation's history. Shopkeeper vigilance, being followed around in stores, waiter indifference, you know, not getting quick respectful treatment, teacher devaluation. That's a very important manifestation of personally mediated racism. When a teacher looks at a young child and thinks that child can't learn and puts them off in the ADD track where that child will never even know their full potential, much less have the opportunity to develop to their full potential. Now, before I get off of personally mediated racism, I have to say that like institutionalized, it can be through acts of doing, acts of commission, as well as acts of not doing, acts of omission. But even more profound and important is that in personally mediated racism, can be unintentional as well as intentional. That is, you do not have to have intended to be racist to have had a racist impact. The third level of racism that I describe, internalized racism, I define as acceptance by members of the stigmatized races of negative messages about our own abilities and intrinsic worth. How can that impact your health? Well, self-devaluation, feeling maybe you're really not as good at. You know, maybe you shouldn't even try to graduate from high school. Banish that thought, okay? <laughs> <laughs> right? Or maybe you shouldn't apply to that job or to that college. And it even turns into fratricide, you know, black on black or Latino on Latino crime. Because if you don't value yourself, you won't value somebody who looks just like you. And you just as soon off them as not. The white man's Isis Calder syndrome, that phraseology comes from my parents' generation. What it meant then and what it still means today for some is say that you're black and you need a lawyer. You might go seek out a white lawyer over a black lawyer. You know, if you need a doctor, you might go look for the white doctor over the black doctor. If your water is warm, you might go way down the street to get the white man's ice over the black man's ice, deeply believing that the white man's ice is colder, deeply internalizing the myth of white superiority. Basically, uh, you know, this internalized racism turns into resignation, helplessness, hopelessness, not lots of self-destructive health behaviors, and it's about accepting the limitations to our own full humanity of the box into which we've been placed. So now I want to illustrate these three levels of racism 
institutionalized, personally mediated, and internalized, with a teaching story. And I have to start, all of my stories are sparked by something I've seen with my own real eyes, so I have to start with what I saw, and then we're going to make it a story about racism. My husband and I, newly married up in New York, moved down to Baltimore for me to finish my PhD at Hopkins by our first freestanding house, beautiful house with a big wraparound porch with flower boxes all on the porch. Well, we closed in the house in October, so we aren't going to plant flowers for the winter, but when spring comes, we're all excited. We're going to run out and plant our marigold seeds. We look at the boxes on the porch, and we see that some of the boxes have dirt in them already, but some of the boxes are empty. So my husband dutifully goes down to the gardening store, hauls big old bags of potting soil, and we fill up the empty boxes. And then we take equal numbers of our seeds, and we plant them in our boxes, and we water them. And I am not the gardener in the family, so I just sit back, going to enjoy, right? <laughs> and about three weeks later, I walk out of my front door looking at these flower boxes, and I stopped in my tracks because it looked to me like we had planted completely different species of plants in some boxes versus the others. In some of the boxes, the boxes were full of plants, and the plants were tall and vigorous looking. And in other boxes, there were just a few plants in them, and they were scrawny and scraggly looking. And then I realized what had happened. That potting soil turned out to be rich, fertile soil so that every single seed planted in it had sprouted. The strong seed had grown tall and vigorous, but even the weak seed had made it halfway up. That old soil that we had found in the boxes turned out to be poor, rocky soil so that the weak seed planted in the poor, rocky soil had died. And even the strong seed in that soil had to struggle to make it to a middling height. Now, if you all are gardeners in this assembly, then Maybe you've seen this with your own, real, your own real eyes. Maybe you've composted half your garden. And this image is really about the importance of the soil, the importance of the environment. But we're going to make it a story about racism by introducing a gardener. So now we're going to have a gardener who has two flower boxes, one which she knows to have rich, fertile soil, and one which she knows to have poor, rocky soil. And she has seed for the same kind of flowers, except some of the seed is going to produce pink blossoms and some of the seed is going to produce red blossoms, and the gardener prefers red over pink. So what does she do? She puts the red seed in the rich fertile soil and the pink seed in the poor rocky soil, and three weeks later she sees in her garden what I saw in mine. In that rich fertile soil, all the red seed is sprouted, strong seed, tall and vigorous, weak seed at least making it halfway up. In that poor rocky soil, the weak pink seed has died. Here comes a strong pink seed just trying to make it, and then those flowers go to seed. And the next year, the same thing happens, and then those flowers go to seed. And year after year after year after year, the same thing happens, until finally, about 10 years later, the gardener's looking at her flower boxes, and she says, you know, I was right to prefer red over pink. <laughs> so we're going to interrupt the story there to say this first part of the story is about how institutionalized racism works, where you had the initial historical insult of the separation of the seed into the two types of soil. You had the contemporary structural factors of the flower boxes keeping the soil separate. And then through inaction in the face of need, you have perpetuation of this inequity. But let's pick the story back up and say, well, where is personally mediated racism in the garden? Well, the gardener's looking at red, loving red, and she looks over at pink and she says, oh, those flowers sure are scrawny and scraggly. So she plucks off the pink blossoms before they can even go to seed. Or she might notice that a pink seed has blown into the rich, fertile soil and she plucks it out before it can even establish itself, which is some of the anti-affirmative action stuff that goes on. And where is internalized racism in the garden? Well, the red flowers are just living their lives, just living, being red, many of them not even understanding that they're benefiting from enriched soil. The pink flowers are looking over at the red, thinking red is grand and wishing with all their hearts that they too could be red. And here come the bees, and the bees are minding their own business collecting nectar, but of course pollinating at the same time. So here comes a bee into one of the pink flowers, and then bzzz to another pink flower, and bzzz to this other pink flower, and that flower's like, get away from me, bee. Do not bring me any of that pink pollen. I prefer the red, because the pink flower has internalized that red is better than pink. So now the question arises, what do we do to set things right in this garden? Well, we could start by saying, let's address the internalized racism. Let's go talk to the pink flowers. You know, power to the pink. Pink is beautiful. <laughs> and that's an important intervention. I am not belittling that in intervention. That is an important intervention. But if that's all that we do, it is not going to change the situation for the pink flowers. Okay, so then you say, I got it. 
Let's address the personally mediated racism. Let's go have a conversation with the gardener. Or better yet, let's have a workplace multicultural workshop for the gardener. <laughs> All good. I love them, right? So we do. We have our workshop. And in the workshop, we say, dear gardener, would you please stop plucking those pink flowers? And maybe she will, and maybe she won't. But even if she does, it's still not going to change the situation in which they find themselves. I think that if we really want to set things right in the garden, we have to address the institutionalized racism, which means we have to either break down the boxes and mix up the soil, or if you want to keep separate boxes, that's all right too, although it makes it easier going forward to keep segregating resources. But if you keep separate boxes, you are going to have to enrich that poor rocky soil until it's as rich as the rich fertile soil. And when you do that, my goodness, the pink flowers will flourish. They'll be looking beautiful, grand, and glorious. And then when your pink flowers are looking equally beautiful to the red, you will have also addressed the internalized racism in that intervention. And you might also address the personally mediated racism. Now, the original gardener may have to go to her grave preferring red over pink, but her children growing up and seeing the flowers equally beautiful would be less likely to have that kind of attitude. So in this story, I have illustrated these three levels of racism, institutionalized, personally mediated, and internalized, and very strongly suggested that if we want to set things right in the garden, we have to at least address the institutionalized racism. Good if we address all the levels at the same time, but we have to at least address the institutionalized racism, and when we do, the other levels may take care of themselves. Before I leave the gardener's tale, there's one more question that I haven't raised so far, and it's a very important question, and that is, who is the gardener? Because after all, the gardener is the one that I gave the power to decide, the power to act, and control of resources, which in my mind are the elements of self-determination. So somebody in the room might say, well, government is part of the gardener, and that's true. Or they might say foundations are part of the gardener, and that's true. And media might be part of the gardener, and that can be true. Or corporations, or even communities to the extent that they can have self-determination. But whoever the gardener is, it is dangerous when the gardener is allied with one group. Uh, in my picture of this, I paint the gardener red, which is why she prefers red over pink. And it is also dangerous when the gardener is not concerned with equity, when she can look at her two flower boxes and think that her garden is beautiful because she's not even really counting the pink flowers as part of her garden. And our challenge is what to do about the gardener. Do we try to make the gardener polka dotted or striped or fuchsia? Do the pink flowers have to grow or recruit their own gardener? Lots of questions that come out of this. And I'm looking at my time right now, so I know that we're about to shift to questions. But before we do that, I want somebody to ask me a question about the UN Anti-Racism Treaty. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I want to just start some of the thinking about questions that have come out of the gardener's tale. One of my favorite questions that's come out of the gardener's tale is why should the red flowers share their soil? Now, that's a very important question. First of all, it shows the power of the story to start conversations that we wouldn't have if we would be talking about racism between you and me. That would never come up, right? But my answer to that question is that that soil does not belong to the red flowers. It belongs to the garden. Another important thing is, well, what would make the gardener know that, that something was wrong? You know, they, the gardener's children at least always grow up, and they see the pink flowers short and the red flowers tall. Well, isn't it natural for them to just assume that that's the nature of things? And that points out the importance of us making the flower boxes transparent. That points to the importance of us talking about the differences in the quality of the soil, that place matters. But you see, place matters, and the other thing is how people get in place also matters. It's not happenstance. The fact that we have boxes with different qualities of soil is not happenstance. And the way that we are distributed among those boxes is not happenstance. And so I hope that in this next half hour, we will have continued conversation about racism as one of those systems of power that is distributing the flowers inequitably. Thank you for this part. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we are listening to a Friday forum featuring Dr. Kamara Jones, Research Director on Social Determinants of Health at the Center for Disease Control. We will return to our speaker in a minute for the traditional City Club questions, for which I have no doubt there will be some. 
Please formulate your questions now and uh, remember to keep them brief and in the form of a question. We welcome all of you here today and those listening on 90.3 WCPN Idea Stream, WCLV, WTAM, or one of the many radio stations across the country. Our television broadcast partner is WBIZ PBS Idea Stream. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. Our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. Uh, we would like to welcome today's guests at tables hosted by Baker and Hostetler, Kent State University, Neighborhood Progress, Inc., Neighborhood Leadership Institute, St. Luke's Foundation, and YMCA, We Run This City. Thank you for your support. As I mentioned earlier, today's, uh, today's program is, is sponsored by uh, the St. Luke's Foundation. And today is the Thomas L. E. Bloom Memorial Forum on Overlooked Citizens of the Inner City, made possible by a generous endowment gift from the friends of Thomas Bloom. Now we would like to return to our speaker for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphones today are City Club Program Director Carrie Miller and 100th Anniversary Assistant Director Betsy Wallace. Dr. Jones, thank you. That was wonderful. And I really want to hear about the UN statement, but I also have a question, okay. <laughs> which is, what is your assessment of the provisions that have just gone into effect in the National Health Care Law, the Affordable Care Act, regarding um, the, our ability to collect data on disparities and how effective that's going to be in helping us move forward? Um, which specific provisions do you want to ask about? The, the provision that just went into effect, my understanding is in March, mm -hmm. that will enable us to collect data for the first time to really assess yes. what's happening with disparities. So I think, um, first of all, I have to make it clear, even though I work at the CDC, that when I make comments and answer questions, that I'm not speaking on behalf of the CDC or the U.S. government. Um, <laughs> okay. And um, I think it's very important for us to be able to monitor uh, disparities in terms of health groups, in racial groups. Some people say we shouldn't measure race at all. I think that um, the Affordable Care Act, the Section 4302 provisions, actually um, allow us to talk about ethnicity in many groups, but not for whites and blacks. It's actually quite interesting. There was a lot, yes. If you look at it, there was an expansion in terms of uh, ethnicities within you know, Hispanic groups, within Asian groups, but white and black were left as if they were unitary, which reflects in my mind um, a, cultural, a cultural kind of predisposition to understand the first racial thing. Well, actually, American Indian white was the first racial thing that happened in this country. But the big you know, black-white divide as being sort of indivisible, even though we recognize that white is a created definition just like black is. So that was my observation about the Section 4302 uh, requirements. But I think that it's important for us to collect data by race, to shine the bright light of inquiry lots of places, asking the question, could racism be operating here? 30 years ago, if you asked the question, could racism be operating in terms of how vigorously coronary artery disease would be worked up, people would say no, until we started looking at those data. We need to ask the question, could racism be operating here by looking at data by race? But then the more important question is how? is racism operating here? And to answer that question, it's not just, oh, well, we have evidence of differential treatment in this health system. We have evidence of differential uh, education uh, achievement. We have differences in, in income. But it's to say, what are the mechanisms by which that's happening? And in my mind, racism is not some miasma or cloud that we can't get a handle on, but it's actually a system with identifiable and addressable mechanisms in our structures, in our policies, practices, norms, and values, where to me, structures are the who, what, when, and where of decision making, who's at the table and who's not, what's on the agenda and what's not. Policies are the written how of decision making, practices and norms are the unwritten how of decision making, and values are the why. And we need to be brave and take the question, how is racism operating here into all of our settings, our work settings, our community settings, our children's schools, trying to identify mechanisms where we could have some kind of impact. I don't know, that's kind of a long and windy answer to that. Thank you. Questions? 
Hello, Dr. Jones. My Hi. name is Tina Kondakai, and I'm at Kent State University. Uh, fairly recently, the governor of South Carolina decided to vote against um, allowing free vaccinations for youth for HPV. Right. Um, I have had some conversations with medical professionals, and among those, including physicians, who are really not pleased with that decision. And, and part of their displace, um, displacement with it was regarding the fact that they too were treating youth who were presenting with HPV and other sexually transmitted diseases. Um, I myself um, know that those physicians probably were not aware that that, I don't know how much of the, the governor's decisions would do to the fact that it would require um, immunization of those youth. Mm -hmm. However, I am concerned about the systems implications of that and wondering how would you address that among your medical peers? So again, I'm not speaking on behalf of the CDC. <laughs> um, I think that we should protect our children, you know, and if we have protections, you know, we know that HPV causes cervical cancer. That's not even disputed. And the issue tends to be, as I understand it, that people say, well, why would you vaccinate a child for something that's sexually transmitted? Are you communicating to that child that you expect sexual activity? And I think not. I think that you're protecting children. So that's my personal view on that. Uh, Dr. Jones, you've had a remarkable uh, diversified career in medicine, uh, public health, as a professor in some very prestigious uh, universities, uh, and also certainly as a practitioner, being a family practitioner. Uh, the new Affordable Care Act, which uh, uh, Republicans refer to as Obamacare, uh, is providing uh, insurance coverage for the first time to literally uh, millions of people. And that'll require a lot of service from uh, uh, general practitioners, from family practitioners, and from specialists. And my question is, uh, what suggestions do you have as to where we can find, where this country can find, uh, the additional physicians that will be required to provide all this new service for these millions of new patients? So I see one of your colleagues here at the table pointing to all the young people sitting around the table. <laughs> so certainly we have to, certainly we have to um, create a, a big net to draw a lot of young people into the health fields and medicine in particular. Um, but there are also other models in the meantime until we wait for all of these people to get through high school and college and, and medical school. And one of the models that's been particularly intriguing to me is community-oriented primary care. It's an old model of where a health institution takes responsibility for the health and well-being of a geographically defined community. So that health institution is not, not just trying to address the needs of people who present at the door, but also trying to address unmet and even unrecognized need in that geographically defined community. It involves a partnership between the health center and the community members in terms of identifying problems, which might not be diabetes, it might be the street lights are out or we don't, our schools are failing us. But addressing all of that and by training, hiring, training and deploying community health workers to actually be the additional hands and feet of the health institution in the community, not just to do patient navigation or even patient education in homes or screening in homes, but to do identification of neighborhood assets and hazards, to do organizing and the like. And so that model, which was developed by Sydney and Emily Clark in the 1950s in South Africa, it was brought to the U.S. in the 1960s by Jack Geiger, Count Gibson, and John Hatch in Columbia Point in Massachusetts as well as in Mount Bayou, Mississippi, and it was actually the basis on which our, our community health centers were modeled. There was a whole big uh, Health Services and Resources Administration book on it published in the 80s, articles. There was a whole Institute of Medicine report on it, but it's fallen out of favor. It's now being resurrected not as patient-centered medical homes, but as community-centered health homes. That model, I think, can help us bridge until we have enough providers. The Affordable Care Act also supports community health centers, which can be so that if you get primary care, you don't need as much tertiary care if you have more people who are doing primary care. And it also um, continues to support the National Health Service Corps, which does forgiveness for physicians. Uh, you know, they pay some of the tuition and that kind of thing, so those things are important. 
Um, so there are lots of mechanisms, even within the Affordable C Care Act, that are addressing it. But I think that also a new model of delivering care and of responsibility, not for patients who happen to be on my HMO panel or patients who happen to come to my facility, but for geographically defined communities. Wouldn't it be delightful, again, I'm not speaking for the U.S. government, wouldn't it be delightful if we were to lay down a geographic grid on this nation and nobody could fall through the cracks? Because even if you were without a home, you would be standing someplace and somebody would be responsible for you. Good afternoon. My name afternoon. is Colleen Cotter. I'm with the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland. And unexpected question, I would like you to talk about the UN Treaty on Racism. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'll first say, who ever heard of the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination? Just a show of hands. A few people. A few people. I would say, looking, it's about eight or ten people in this room of about 150. Well, what it is, is a United Nations International Anti-Racism Treaty that was voted into being by the UN General Assembly in 1965. So now I'm going to ask you, since we've never heard of it, do you think that the US signed this treaty? You know, so there's a lot of no's going on here. But big surprise, actually our government did sign it in 1966. But the little uh, tricky thing there is that we can sign all the treaties we want, but our treaties have to be ratified by the Senate before they take any effect. So who thinks that the U.S. Senate ratified this treaty? <laughs> so a lot of no's and some nervous laughter because it's a trick. Yes, the U.S. Senate did ratify this treaty. <laughs> they ratified it 28 years later in 1994. But what it means is that today we have international treaty obligations under this US anti, I mean UN anti-racism treaty. Our obligations include doing right by the treaty, which is only nine pages long. You can go to the UN. You can just Google ICERD, I-C-E-R-D, and it'll take you right there. Nine pages, and you can read the treaty. So not only are we supposed to do right by the treaty, but we're also um, obligated to make periodic reports to a UN committee on the elimination of racial discrimination. And so our reports, our State Department writes our reports every six years. We submit them. Our last report was submitted in 2007 to this committee, and the committee gets the report and it gets so-called shadow reports, and then they send back what they call their concluding observations. So we got our concluding observations to that report in May of 2008. It's only 14 pages. You can read it. It's not a telephone book, so let's all read it this weekend. <laughs> and it starts out saying, Dear United States, thank you for your report. We remain concerned about racial profiling, residential segregation, disproportionate incarceration, you know, uh, differential access to health care, the achievement gap in education, and on and on and on. And it also says, dear United States, in paragraph 13, dear United States, you need to establish a mechanism for ensuring compliance with this treaty at the federal, state, and local levels. And dear United States, paragraph 36, you need to let your general public know about the existence of this treaty. So now, every time I talk, I do my part. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Tony Miner. I'm a local pastor, and I work with a Lutheran agency that's very engaged with congregations around many of the issues that we're talking about now. I would like to go back to the story of the gardener. Let's talk about the gardener's faith community. In what way should, should have the faith community or that person's pastor, priest, rabbi helped inform him or her uh, of what, what was going on and influence his, his ability to address the issue and respond to the problem that he was facing? That is a very interesting question. And I would say that up to about four or five years ago, I wouldn't have been prepared with an answer for you because I was so focused on the differences in the quality of the soil in the boxes that I wasn't thinking about the gardener's initial preference for red over pink, which set up the initial situation. So I would say that the gardener, which is anybody who, has, who is part of the self-determination <coughs> group in our nation, needs to understand that it is dangerous and destructive to have a preference for one over the other. Right? That is what set up the initial situation. So I used to not think about values as part of the equation, but I think that values are an important part of the equation. So then how do we get people to, 
to value all of us equally. Um, I think there are three barriers in our nation. Um, one of them I would describe as a, a very narrow focus on the individual, so that we're not even counting, sometimes our even extended family versus the rest of us as being us. You know, there's kind of a narrow me versus others kind of sensibility. And I think to get past that, we need to do a lot of bubble bursting. We all travel in bubbles, in our bubbles at work, and then we might go to church, we might go to our children's school or live in our neighborhood. And very often, we are not aware that just across town, there are people who are just as smart, hardworking, brilliant, kind, generous as we are, who live in very different circumstances. So we need to break through bubbles in that. The second problem, in addition to the narrow focus on the individual, which can be addressed through values and all, is our ahistorical nation, uh, nature as a country. We think that the way things are when we are born are the way things, that things have always been and the way things always will be. And we don't understand history, how things came to be. That's how the gardener's children could look at the flower boxes and think, oh, it's just natural for the pink flowers to be shorter, because they won't even know the history. And they're not looking at the soil. The third thing is what people have called the myth of meritocracy. I put that in quotes, but people, there are books about the myth of meritocracy. And what that, is, what that means is, well, we have this notion in our country that if you work hard, you can make it. And it is true that most people who have made it have worked hard. Not all, but most people who have made it have worked hard. But there are many, many, many other people who are working just as hard or harder who will never make it because of an uneven playing field. And this myth of meritocracy that says that if you haven't made it, you may be stupid or lazy or not trying hard enough, that denial of racism that is part of that helps contributes to us undervaluing those among us who have the most need. So in addressing those three issues, the narrow focus on the individual, the ahistorical nature of our country, and the myth of meritocracy, perhaps clergy can help not only the flowers but the gardener in this. But I think we must address this differential valuation. It is actually at the root of the problem. It set up the problem. Dr. Jones, yes. first, uh, welcome to Cleveland. Hope Thank you'll you. come back for a continuation of this dialogue. Thank you know, you. going back to the Affordable Care Act, yes. the genius behind the attack on that act, some may say the evil genius, but was the realization that the Achilles heel was the individual mandate. Yes. I know you worked for the federal government. If instead you were queen, okay. um, <laughs> you've described this complicated system that perpetuates this inequity. Right. Where's the Achilles heel? Where would you start if you were queen and could start to dismantle this? whole system that has uh, kept uh, many communities uh, in an unequal status? With the schools, with education. I would start with education because all of our kids are born with equal potential and then we mess them up. <laughs> We're going to all die off and the kids are the only part of the future that we can touch. So I would start with vigorous, you know, zero to five education, excellent public schools, for all of our kids, I would enhance, as, as uh, we're doing right now, community colleges because in addition to taking down barriers to opportunity, we have to create small bridges to opportunity. You can take down the wall, but if there's still a chasm, I can't jump across it. You need to create a little bridge for me. Community colleges can be part of that bridge. I would involve, you know, I talk about the mechanisms of any of our structured inequities being in our structures, policies, practices, norms, and values. The who's at the table is very important, and the what's on the agenda is very important. And when any of us find ourselves at a decision-making table, we should look around and say, who is not here who has an interest in that proceeding? And then we don't just represent them, we try to find them a way to the table. So I would open up all decision-making processes so that people who are really affected would have voice. Because just because you, you're down and out doesn't mean you're ignorant, and it doesn't mean you don't have brilliant ideas, right? So I would put all of my health money and all my other money, all my everything money in education, okay? Because the kids are our treasures. And I would try to have us come from a stance, not of my children versus your children, but recognizing that these are all our children. We need to value all of these as our children and the future for our nation. So, I mean, I could go on and on, but, I, but that's where I would start.
Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we have been listening to a Friday forum featuring Dr. Kamara Jones discussing why place matters. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.com. PNC is proud to support the presentation of this City Club of Cleveland Friday Forum on WVIZ PBS. Additional support comes from Cleveland State University. Support for closed caption transcripts of City Club forums is provided by the Nordson Corporation Foundation.